Hello, everyone, and we have uh, we have another very special episode today. Uh, you guys really liked the priest episode, so we decided to get a great priest, but he cancelled, so we have Father John. Uh, he is a parish priest at uh, Teotokos Dormitory Church in uh, Norfolk in Virginia, <laughs> and he will tell you the story about that. It's one of my favorite stories. Uh, his church ranks 4.8 review average on Facebook, which is relatively good as far as churches go that don't have big scandals so good for father john he will also explain why he has such a poor rating <laughs> father john what brings you here today except me blackmailing you <laughs> you you told me i had to so well there it is <laughs> so there it is yeah uh and it's true i my church here in norfolk virginia does have a 4.8 star rating uh, which used to be like a 4.9 star rating. And, and it was a 4.9 star rating because one of my parishioners felt like nobody would believe a five star rating. And so he deliberately knocked off a star to bring it down just enough to seem legit. Right? He's a business man. Uh, but then I got an additional like tenth of a point knocked off because, uh, it, well, it's Boki's fault. It's Boyan's fault. He pulled me into this debate with an iconoclast uh, Protestant pastor from Georgia. Not Those the are the worst. State, the state. Uh, I don't think there are any iconoclasts or Protestant pastors in the Republic of Georgia, but in the state there are tons of them. Uh, so he pulled me into this debate with the guy, and then somehow or another the guy uh, went hunting for my parish website a Facebook page and and found it and proceeded to spam it with uh, one star comments and reviews. Uh, and he just wouldn't let up. Uh, but I don't I don't really know like I'm not I'm not real tech savvy. So finally I had to, I I had to I felt like Boyan was partially responsible for this. Like this is partially his fault. Well, yeah. So Thanks, Eve. <laughs> I had to uh, I had to ask him to. To, to show me how to how to block someone and i couldn't figure <laughs> out how to do it how do i make you know, this stop because the guy just would not let up he would not quit B, did comment you know after comment. sorry did i you know how to block someone on facebook of me? course i do that is why i have everybody agreeing with me on my page it's easy <laughs> ban 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 yeah, it's more difficult on Twitter where like you have the whole world against you. So you have to ban everybody by name. <laughs> okay. Uh, Question, um, the, the church, your, uh, your church, what, what church does it belong in a broad sense? Oh, and my, my parish is Dormition of the Theotokos. It's uh, the, the August so, 15th, the feast, and it belongs to the Orthodox Church in America. It's so Diocese OCA. of the South, yeah, OCA Diocese of the South. We only get those CA priests on on the show. That's, yeah, that's that's uh, Boyan's fault. Yeah, They're the so only far people. we're the apparently the only people who will be friends with him. Yeah, uh, we would have one more, but he died recently, so we had to cancel that that that, that guest uh, because of uh, act of God. Uh, however, Father, uh, you're probably aware of the horrible pandemic that's occurring recently. I don't know if you have heard or noticed. Um, so, how should we as Orthodox live the holiest of weeks, most, uh, the two most holiest and contrasted weeks in our church calendar without mm. most of us attending church? That's a great question. Um, I think right up front, we want to acknowledge that uh, this is a a really unusual, unprecedented sort of experience for all of us. Uh, I was talking to my 91-year-old grandmother earlier today, who was old enough to live through the Depression and World War II. Uh, and we were commenting on the fact that people who are that old can remember similar crises, but most of us who are younger have never been through, even my parents' age, have never been through any kind of national or global uh, crisis of this proportion that's required this kind of 
sacrifice or difficulty. So this is a this is a really new experience for all of us. And uh, as far as the church goes, a, a, a very painful experience. And uh, it's painful for everyone. For the uh, parishioners who one Sunday can be at church and then the next Sunday they can't. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like you were snatched off the street in Soviet Russia. Yeah. And uh, cut off from your your life. Uh, very shocking, very surprising. But it's equally painful for the 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 priests. Uh, at least the ones who aren't misanthropes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was uh, telling people um, like a lot of priests today you live stream your services and i tend to follow them uh, through a live stream if i get the chance you know if i'm not playing a video game or something or doing something equally as important you know something that gives me a valid reason to miss a service um so uh, and they remark like you give yourself responses and okay sometimes you simply have to do that but uh, i remarked how how painful it sounds that you say peace be unto you and that is one response that you gi you don't give you don't say right. into your spirit and i do say it but the silence on the other end is deafening you know and okay it's nice that i say and probably many of your other parishioners but for you right there it might be you know even more heartrending it really is. And, uh, you know, because I'm live streaming some of these things from behind the the camera, mm -hmm. the little services I do that are just prayer services, uh, I can see people typing in their responses mm -hmm. uh, as but it you goes. you can't read. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, very unsettling uh, and unnatural. Uh, and not the way things are supposed to be. And yet, and yet this is the way they are. And I think there is something important in that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an instinct in grief that we have to uh, find a way to restore normal, to try to find some handle that we can get a hold of that lets us feel like things are normal and that we're not out of control. And that's a very universal human instinct. Yeah. It's also one that uh, often sabotages us, that does not serve us well. Uh, because things aren't normal yeah. and pretending that they are or trying to make them normal uh, simply prevents us from learning from or growing through the difficult situation that we're in. Mm -hmm. When Job is sitting on the dung heap in the ashes, yeah. uh, he can't pretend that everything is normal, and he doesn't try to. Yeah. Uh, so it is uh, in this situation. Priests are are doing what they can to preserve connection with their people, yeah. to try to keep you know to to offer something as a consolation, and I think they should, yeah. and I think that's good. Um. This is a great segue uh, because uh, now there is a lot of worry and worrying about the disease itself aside. Um, the Orthodox are worried that they're missing out uh, on grace and Christ because they, they cannot receive the Eucharist. They are worried that they will die in the state of mortal sin or however they phrase it without confession. Catechumens are denied baptism. Uh, inquirers are denied uh, entrance to catechumenate and so on. Uh, how, uh, in your pastoral experience, how, uh, how do you deal with these sort of issues? You know, this constant worry that maybe 
God will in a way slight us because we cannot get to communion, we cannot confess our sins, we cannot get baptized, we cannot get chrismated, and so on. There's a really lovely little uh it's not a saying exactly, but it's in the writings of Saint Simeon the New. Mm -hmm. A little reflection in which he he reflects on this very kind of thing. What happens? He's talking about perfection mm -hmm. uh, and the you know the requirement of all Christians to be perfect, uh, to be holy uh, as as God is holy. And he asks himself rhetorically, you know, what happens if I die and I'm not, I haven't done it yet. I'm not perfect. What happens if I die before I've completed the task? And uh, he answers his own question in this way. He says, wherever you are in the race, in the running of the race, when your time is up, God will complete it for you. God will, as long as you keep running, as long as you just don't quit, God can accomplish and complete what you have begun. So it is for the catechumens and the faithful who are not in this situation because they choose to be any more than an innocent man taken off the street in Soviet Russia or Father Roman Braga snatched up by the communists in Romania was yeah. in, the, in prison because he chose to be or because he had done something to cause the situation that he was in. Uh, it is simply the circumstance that God is allowing us to go through. That God is allowing us to suffer. Mm -hmm. And his mercy extends to cover our inability to fulfill, to fulfill the letter of the law. True. And... What is expected of us is simply that we don't give up, mm -hmm. that we don't quit, mm -hmm. uh, and say, "Oh well, I can't, I can't go to church this Sunday, and so my life in Christ is done." There is nothing preventing us from keeping the commandments mm -hmm. or following the dictates of the gospel in the situation that we're in. True. It is unexpected, mm -hmm. and in that way, it's difficult for that reason. You know, most people don't respond well to unexpected change. They yeah. don't uh, react well to it. When things are different than we thought they would be, we usually respond badly. True. Uh, and so it's not surprising that people uh, are, they, they get upset, and then they have a reaction to that. And uh, there wasn't much preparation for most everybody. You know, suddenly it's just we can't come to church anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's understandable that people were upset. Okay, so we ha we give that a minute and we uh, have that feeling. And then we have to come to our senses a little bit and say, okay, what now? Mm -hmm. uh, do I stop practicing my faith? Do I stop being a Christian? Do I... Uh, until I'm allowed to go back to doing things the normal way? Mm -hmm. Or do I find a way to continue and to commune with Christ in my heart? Mm -hmm. uh, Father Roman sa sa related this story one time. That somebody asked him, he spent a year in solitary confinement, and somebody asked him, how did you how did you cope with that? How did, you know, it's a, like a six by 11 cell. How did you keep from going crazy? And he said, well, the human spirit naturally wants to go out. Mm -hmm. It's what humans are naturally explorers. They're discoverers. They want to go out. They want to see new things. They want to experience new places. And when you're in that cell, you can't. But if you don't, you'll go crazy. And so you have to go in. And you have to discover that the kingdom of heaven is within you. And you have to learn to find God there when you're deprived of everything else. True. So in a way, yeah, so this uh, 
this situation does pose great uh, outward challenges, but also great inward um, opportunities uh, for us to practice the gospel, to grow in sanctity, and so on. Um, I also wanted, um, you posted on your Facebook page a video, which I told other people is basically uh, go gospel uh, 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 gospel and orthodoxy in one short video where you obtain the vessels. Uh, oh. Would you like to share again that with us? Because I found it so beautiful. Uh, uh, while you were opening them, and they were quite remarkable and beautiful, but it is what you said at the end. Would you uh, share with us the story of the vessels and then how you plan to use them? Sure, sure. Uh, as I mentioned in the video, my parish grew a lot this last year, and I also got a couple of other priests who are now at my parish. And mm -hmm. So for Lent, I wanted to do a second pre-sanctified during the week, which I hadn't done in the past. Uh, and, but I, I had a problem in that my discos is too small for the Sunday liturgy and two pre-sanctified lambs. It wouldn't hold them. And my artiforium, the, 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 the box that you put the pre-sanctified lamb in at, during the liturgy was also too small. It would only hold one. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I ordered some, I had, I had a donor who gave me a, a generous gift and, uh, to put toward purchasing new things and so i found i found a, a workshop in greece that would hand make uh very beautiful things and i picked out just exactly what i wanted they sent me little videos of the of the the man you know hammering on the silver and carving it out and it was i was and anybody who knows me knows i really love uh beautiful things in the church i, I really love for the church to have beautiful things uh, because well for a lot of reasons but one of the primary ones is that life can be very ugly and banal and difficult, uh, especially if you're poor, especially if you don't have material means yourself. Life can be very ugly and plain. And when you come to church and the church is beautiful, it lifts the soul, it lifts the spirit. Especially when you know that it's this way, not because we need to make it this way to impress God, but because God loves us and wants us to experience the beauty of his kingdom. And so it is a consolation, especially for the poor, especially for those whose lives have so little beauty, to be surrounded and to be at home, welcome, in a place that is replete with beauty, so that they are, they are invited into the richness of the kingdom of heaven. And so I was really excited about this, really excited about these things, and I put a lot of time and effort into picking out just the things I wanted and to getting them, and finally they came. And I was so afraid they wouldn't because of the, you know, the virus and the global mm -hmm. uh, you know, difficulties in shipping things, and it had come all the way from Greece, but it came, and it came in, in you know, quick time. And so I was super excited to get them just after the announcement that no one could come to church anymore. Now, these vessels are quite large, especially for my parish. You know, they're, they're, they're large enough for a cathedral, which was partially a mistake on my part. I, I don't convert to metric units apparently very well. So I, I, I sort of overestimated, I think. But anyway, uh, Maybe God will help to fill it up eventually. But anyway, so these things came and they were they were beautiful and they were, and they were so exciting. And yet there wasn't anyone to share them with. And so I, I said in the video uh, what was simply in my heart, which is that I'm not going to use these things. I'm not going to I'm going to put them back in the packaging and leave them there until we can all be together again because they're not mine they belong to us they are the treasure of the church and i don't want to have them myself mm -hmm. apart i only want to have them with the church the people of god and so they are sitting waiting for the day well let us hope that you get to serve with those vessels as soon as possible you know 
with all of the people finally assembled. Yeah, like next week. So. <laughs> uh, they, oh, please, please, God. <laughs> yeah, I kind of doubt that's going to happen. First of all, thank It's God. definitely off the table for us. Yeah. Well, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, the United States is, the, you know, hit the most. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, you know. Here in this state, uh, Virginia has a shelter in place order through June 10th. Ooh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So I lot. couldn't have any more than four other people in the building unless he lifts the order early until then. I have a couple of questions, though. I was listening carefully, which I seldom do. Um, but it was it was it was a very inspiring story, actually. Thank God you didn't order them from AliExpress. They would never come. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> yeah, or they will be... come with a special additional present you didn't ask for, <laughs> um, or you would simply get something that you you, you didn't order. Um, I just said okay. um, <laughs> You said with the, well, let's not go into technicalities. Well, well, okay, but but speaking of technicalities, when you're streaming your service. Can't you have somebody on the other end actually responding, like somebody with a nice voice? Sure. Not, not the boy. Not the boy. Not no. like Milos. Somebody like well, me. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I didn't ask either of you. Of course. Uh, for for that reason, uh, I I can for some of the services. So for the sun for the liturgies. And for the Holy Week services that we are doing in the church, I, I will have a chanter and a server or two. Mm -hmm. uh, but in order to honor the intention of the shelter and at home order as much as possible, the Archbishop has limited very much mm -hmm. how many services we can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the things that I do extra, the little prayer services that I do uh, in the church, extra i do simply by myself because the archbishop's instructions are to preserve the isolation as much as we can while mm -hmm. still uh, offering the services particularly the liturgies at which everyone can be commemorated and put in the chalice and i think that's an important point to emphasize uh, particularly if you have any any readers who are not real familiar with the divine liturgies of the church uh, at both the liturgy of basil and chrysostom not at the pre-sanctified liturgy which is why i'm not doing it now or i didn't do it this week but at the liturgies of basil and chrysostom all the faithful can be commemorated and one of the last what last things the priest does before he uh, ends the service is to take all the particles all the pieces of bread that have been taken out with the names of all the faithful and he what he he, he scrapes them into the chalice with the prayer, wipe away, O Lord, the sins of those remembered here by the prayers of all your saints. So in a sense, everyone is being gathered into the chalice, into the communion of the church, whether they were there or not. And the, the uh, prayer, the lengthy prayer of St. Basil that's hidden in the middle of his anaphora, which of course you would never hear in Serbia, but which is often heard in america i do i do don't tell i won't your your secret safe with me and the internet <laughs> uh, which is you know a bastion of confidentiality uh, as we all know but in the middle of in the middle of that prayer of basil he prays for all kinds of people who are not going to be at church uh ascetics anchorites living in the desert those who are in prisons in mountains caverns of the earth the the prisoners the the, the captives uh people who are absent for any kind of honorable reason the whole church is gathered together in the communion of the chalice even those who are not present and so it's very important that we continue the liturgies mm -hmm. uh, so that all may be all may be prayed for all may be gathered in as the church even if they can't be there so that's important that that continue and we do that with singers and chanters. But for most everything else, uh, we're, we're very limited in what, what, the, what we're allowed to do to, to honor as much as, we, as much as we, he feels appropriate within the bounds of what's legal, the, the expectation of the civil authorities mm -hmm. so that we're not 
trying to flaunt it and get away with as much as we can, but that we're trying to respect it and work cooperate with it as much as we can and still offer on behalf of all the prayers of the church and, and to commune everyone in the chalice. So uh, striking that balance, every bishop does it differently, and I don't want to mm-hmm. criticize anyone for how their bishop decides to do it. There's been far too much of that going on. Oh, yeah. Uh, but well, it, yeah, for those little services, I, I, I'm doing them by myself because I'm, I'm not supposed to have anyone else here with me. But I don't, I don't do, I don't pretend to have, I don't pretend to do all the parts. I don't repeat the prokimena. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't try to. All I do are the, you know, the responses, the, the petitions. Yeah. Uh, but which, could you, could you have somebody on the other end of the stream, actually responding to you? Could you have? Oh, if a I con- wasn't, a, if I wasn't a luddite, but I have no idea how to do that. Yeah, that, that that's that's what I thought. I don't. Um, I am, how do you, I'm, I'm not very I'm not very tech savvy. How do you stream uh, your liturgies, though? Well, I was I was doing it on uh, YouTube Live on our on our YouTube channel and on Facebook Live, and I had you know my phone streaming Facebook and my desk my my laptop streaming YouTube. But then it, last week YouTube upgraded <laughs> their uh, their streaming studio. Okay. Uh, now you have to now you have to integrate software on your end with the software on their end. Uh, and some people seem to do this just fine, but I am I am not good at. I tried to set it up. I followed the instructions. I watched a YouTube tutorial, uh, you know, which is supposed to make it all so easy. And then I did it. And supposed. Somehow or another, I created I created a loop where I was talking back to myself over and over again. Okay. Uh, so I just gave up. I couldn't figure out how to do it. Mm-hmm. But you have two devices. Then you can live stream to Facebook using your laptop, and you can use your phone to dial somebody um, with FaceTime if it's an iPhone or something else like Viber, whatever. And somebody could re- actually respond. I'm just saying it. It's a. It's not impossible, as long as it's not I boring. Hadn't... <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Okay. It's an idea. It might be too complicated, but it's an idea. Well, to some extent, I actually want to preserve the strangeness of the uh-huh. experience. I'm not trying to simulate normal. I actually want it to sink in to everyone how odd this really is. Mm. because it's in confronting that in really facing that and having to deal with how that makes us feel that we can actually grow through this experience. It's not much different than, than the way one approaches dealing with tragedy. The more one tries to push the grief away and act as though things are normal, the more one sublimates one's own natural responses Mm -hmm. and disorders them. We need to feel how painful this is. Mm -hmm. We need to experience that even as we try to stay connected, even as we pray together, even as the priests do what they can to stream the services and continue to offer some connection, we need to balance that with genuinely experiencing the alienating reality of watching all of this on screen. Because it's only when we really face that that we can come to terms with Mm -hmm. a lot of things we need to realize, which is that we, one, I mean, one of the important lessons is that as how precious the, the, the physical community of the church really is. Yes. Even and including especially the people that in the past you may have really not appreciated. How precious the community of the church is, even even though community is hard. However difficult community is, it's a lot better than this. True. 
And I think we have to really realize that. And we have to come to terms with that. We also have to come to terms with the realization how much it is that we get from going to church. Mm-hmm. I said this in a little video that I made for my parish a couple of weeks ago. Uh, after that first week when my, my own family was watching things on, on a computer at home, my oldest son, who's 13, said to me, he said, I, he, you know, I, I'm a convert, so I know what it's like to have a life before orthodoxy. My sons my, my, and my daughter don't. They've never known anything but the church, and so it's in their DNA in a different way. Mm-hmm. And to some extent, they take it for granted the way everybody does. It's just part of the normal landscape of their life. So for my son, this was, this was a shocking experience, and he said, I didn't know – how much church meant to me until I had to watch it and couldn't be there. I had no idea how important it was until I was estranged from it in this way. Sure. And we should all be we should all be grateful that we can have that lesson taught to us without a lot of the attendant suffering that other people have had to learn that lesson with lesson with. We yeah. haven't been snatched by Soviet communist authorities. We're not dragged off to prison somewhere. We're not being taken away from our families and starved in some gulag. We're sitting at home with plenty to eat, with our families intact. We just can't come to church. So we are learning how much it means to us in a painful way, but a way that is nonetheless much less painful and awful than it could be. And for that, I'm deeply grateful. Mm-hmm. It's true. I also that I also think that we're uh, having our in America. Maybe I don't know if it's like this in Serbia, but in America we have uh, a very consumerist way of approaching the church. Uh, we tend to approach it as though it is something that is owed to us. Mm-hmm. Something that belongs to us, my communion, my services, you know, and we want to have things the way we want them because we're Americans, that gummit, and this is this is what you know this you you have to give this to me, and we take it for granted, you know that I'll have communion as often as I want, whenever I want, and however I want it to be, and we we have a very uh self-centered way of approaching and a very casual way of approaching all of these things. Yeah. And I think having them taken away from us is a real opportunity for a conversion of the heart through which we learn to appreciate them in a much deeper way as treasures that don't belong to us but that we are offered as a gift. And if we approach them that way, we, we can appreciate them more deeply and perhaps prepare ourselves to receive them more sincerely, more carefully. So I'm hopeful that this experience, this ice water in the face experience, is also for us a moment of deep repentance uh, of our casualness, of our superficiality, of our fetishization of having everything the way we want it and of our of our tendency to say if I don't have everything just like I want it then it's all over I can't do this you better learn because you're going to have to if you can't survive this what kind of faith do we really have true true this is not just a lesson for christians um it's a, it's a lesson for everybody I mean, the, the problem, the problem of entitlement stretches far beyond the church. And I think people in the church are just a reflection of the entire humankind. When it comes to that, it's, this is not only America. Um, you said, Father John, I don't know how things are in Serbia. Here, things are a bit different. In America, people may, you know, uh, react to, uh, uh, to being banned, to going to church like, it's my right to go to church. It's my God-given right, and so on. In Serbia, it is maybe a little different. Uh, here, <clears throat> uh, here, um, people 
if you're not a strong believing liturgical Christians, which majority of Serbs aren't, um, their tendency is mercantile or mercantile. How, how do you say it? Um, Mercenary? Uh, no, um, well, yeah, uh, it's based on a trade-off. Mercantile. A, a mercantile, yeah. Like, oh, God, uh, uh, Serbs, when they say that they, uh, they will go to church, they don't mean the liturgy, they don't mean to pray, they mean to light a candle. Hmm. And that's usually how they put it. I go to church to light a candle. You know, okay, that's a prayer. But the very, fa uh, the, the very idea to go to church just to pray outside of the candle is you know very unusual for a serbian mind um and um maybe due to the history of orthodoxy which is uh, and this uh, I, I think this part is mostly absent from uh, uh, from a uh, american religious mind maybe not mormon mind <laughs> i don't know but um he, uh, here if there is a reaction it's usually like oh they're persecuting us oh uh, it's the European Union or this uh, conspiracy to prevent us from celebrating. You know, uh, it is through the, as M said in a previous episode, victim uh, victim mentality uh, or martyrs mentality that uh, we tend to observe these things. Out, again, outside of that popular, oh, well, I'll just light a candle when this whole, whole thing uh, blows over. Uh, sadly, for majority of Serbs, as regards to church, uh, this uh, wouldn't uh, be a huge issue, except that, for example, uh, here, uh, Lazarus Saturday um, is basically a kid's holiday. Um, and all children wear these little bells around their necks. Uh, they have uh, pussy willows and so on. And it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. And it is something that uh, is uh, uh, that is sealed into your brain as a child, even if you're uh, the verse of atheists, you'll, you'll love Lazarus Saturday, you know? And in the same way, even the most grievous of atheists will have positive association with the day of St. Saba because it is a, a big holiday for kids. Uh, and I think that in a way, at least in Serbia, this is a good opportunity for a majority of Serbs to realize what it means that the church is taken from you on the day when it's probably one of the only days you actually uh, go there, you know, even if it's for your yearly communion, yearly confession, yearly candle lighting, you know, so uh, it's different shades here. It's similar, but it's different shades. You know, I, I was talking earlier with someone about the tendency that the universal human tendency to uh, have a very transactional relationship with God. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I do these things, you will bless me. If I do these things, you will give me these blessings. And and so, you know, uh, very concerned with the letter of the law mm -hmm. in some ways. You know, uh, this is this is something that Israel was you know, noted for, and the prophets and Christ himself critiqued them for over and over, which was that rather than saying, what does, what's the law for? What does it mean? What's the underlying purpose of it? Mm -hmm. The meaning of it, underlying sense of it. It's simply, what's the least I can do and get God's blessing for my life? Uh, what's, mm -hmm. what's the, the minimum technical requirement to get what I want from God? Which is a very common way that that was the you know Israel did that and we tend to do it today. Yeah, of course. If I just if I just say my prayers and do my fast, uh, or you know go to see these services, then God has to bless me. God has to forgive me. God has to give me what I want. Uh, but this is the definition of magical thinking mm -hmm. that there is that I can get a hold on God somehow that I can compel him to act on my behalf yeah, that it's all that simple mm -hmm. which it's it, it's not but i think it i think actually this is in the human nature of trying to like simplify things that are actually very complex there's nothing as complex as god the creator of the universe so yeah. at the end of the day we that, that's what we're doing all the time uh, i come from this engineering perspective where you always need to simplify things you always need to create a model of things and people tend to oversimplify i think the way 
everything is supposed to work, um, especially church. And and the guys that you the, the the type of people you're mentioning, B, I don't necessarily value that point of view uh, as a Christian point of view. Neither neither do I don't even consider people who treat church and faith and religion like that. I don't even count them as faithful. I might be wrong that that's this is my point that's of view. Pa- no, no, no. That's pagan. Uh, that's pagan thinking with Christian trappings. You know. Yeah, but literally. These people. This uh, t- uh, uh, thousand years ago, these people would you know uh, light candles before statues of P- Perun or or Vesna or uh, whatever deity is there uh, on the pedestal. You know, regardless whose altar it is, as long as it's an altar, you know, as long as it is a place of power, it doesn't matter, you know? Exactly. Like and m- mystical. It, the, the mysticism is, is, is so important where it should yeah. be. If these people go to Tibet, they will roll those prayer wheels. If they went to India, yeah, yeah. they will do things that Hindus do. I, I, I don't know what they do. <laughs> I apologize. I, I'm so, sort of liking, I know that about Buddhist prayer wheels, but Hindus, they will feed milk to mice or something. I don't know. But <laughs> you get what I'm thinking. And um, I, I really like um, how somebody said it, that Christianity isn't a religion of the mass, uh, of uh, massive appeal, you know? Um, and some, uh, some comedian, he said, uh, most people treat Bible like they treat terms and conditions. They simply flip it to the end and click, I agree. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can probably, you know, survive uh, doing that with terms and conditions. But with Bible, it's, as you said, it's way more complicated and in a way, <laughs> way, more da- way, way more dangerous. Well, and rules are always boundaries within which a relationship is intended to thrive. They don't exist for their own sake. They are there to preserve something living in the same way that a fence. Uh, I was years ago, uh, I'm thinking of this now uh, because in the West it's Holy Friday and we're, of course, you know, a week away from our own. Mm-hmm. I was years ago in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, which has olive trees that were probably there at the time Christ himself was in the garden. And it, it was for me the most remarkable part of part of my trip was uh, being there among those trees. But they have very wisely fenced off the trees from the path so that you cannot get in there uh, to preserve them. Uh, fences like rules are there to preserve something living. And when you make the rule the the point for its own sake and ignore the life that it's intended to preserve and to foster, uh, then you will lose the thing itself. True. And you miss the point. And this is what this is what the prophets say about Israel over and over again. Yeah. And this is, you know, it's it's every bit as true for us when we become focused on fulfilling the letter of the law, but ignore the the intention, the spirit of the law, when we when we no longer when that no longer matters. To yeah, us. this this should be done, but not without the other. Right, that's exactly right. And I think we're I think all of us who are experiencing this estrangement from church, and I have to say that. I feel it as a priest, even though I can be here in the building and I can serve at the altar, the sense of alienation, the sense of estrangement is every bit as strong. For me, it's as though an invading army had come and carted off my entire church into slavery somewhere. Uh, If that had happened, of course, I would continue to serve and to pray on behalf of all of them, but it wouldn't feel normal. And it wouldn't feel yeah. right. It, it would. It would be. It would be the way it is now, which is is incredibly painful. Uh, but why is why are we doing this? Part of the answer is simply that the civil authorities mandated it, and we are being obedient to the law like everyone else. Uh, but in the case of many of us here in America, at least, it's also what our bishops have asked of us. Now, there's something important here. Part of it is, is, is the importance of obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. And in this case, 
uh, that obedience is a sacrifice. Uh, but what I wanted to underscore on that point is that we are laying down our life for our friend, for our brother, both our brother or sister in the church, who may be especially vulnerable, our children, our old, our unwell, but also our brothers and sisters after the flesh in the world, our kinsmen after the flesh, it says in the King James Version. We are laying down our life for them. And this is the point that I think one of the one of the fundamental lessons we have to learn. True. That this laying down our life, this taking up the cross, is an experience of death. This being alienated from church like this is like a kind of a dying. I feel like my parish has died. Uh, do I think it's the right thing to do? I do. But it is a dying. And that's what it is to follow Christ. That's what it is to take up the cross, is to die. And that's painful. And I think we have to come to terms with that, that you can't have the cross without suffering, that you can't have the cross without loss, without deprivation, without pain. And that's why most of us don't want to take it up. We want to have the church and all its promises and all of its trappings and our nice, comfortable lives as well. And Christ is now, through this experience saying wrong <laughs> um father over your uh, left shoulder you have that icon of uh, resurrection of lazarus and uh, at least um, at the time of this recording uh lazarus saturday is tomorrow it has already begun with us technically uh, i suppose all of us feel sort of like lazarus imprisoned within the tomb and simply waiting for us uh waiting for christ to call us to burst forth from the tomb and to you know enter into the holy uh holy joyous life that he offers um i want to uh, because you're a priest and at least you and many other priests worldwide you, you have a real rare privilege of actually attending server services de deficient as they may be i just wanted to ask uh, this may be a bit of a silly question. Do you feel a sort of survivor's guilt over your ability, for example, to receive communion, to attend church, again, deficient as it may be, uh, as opposed to those who are not? This is simply just, just popped into my mind as an interesting question, you know? Um, even though I know that as a pastor, you probably feel a very different sort of deprivation now that the church is empty, totally. <clears throat> Oh, I, I maybe maybe I maybe in in response to your question I will probe my feelings more deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, come Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, but I think the overwhelming experience for me <clears throat> is one of longing for my people. Uh, yeah. That I. I am, in a sense, and I said this again in, in, in a little video I made for them, that the services have to continue. Yes. The prayers have to be made. Ministry at the altar shouldn't be stopped unless it's absolutely impossible. But my... The, the feeling that I'm feeling, the thought that I'm thinking the whole time... It's simply that I wish everyone else was here. Uh, my my brother is my life. My sister is my life. Not just the church in terms of the services, and I and and some people are different. You know, there are uh, some people for whom it, it it is the services themselves that matter. For me, as a as a priest. Uh, it's the services and the people that I uh, that I that I serve that I feed, and so it's like asking me what's it like to sit down at a banquet table in a banquet hall that's empty and have all that food in front of me and no one to share it with. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's lonely. Yes. 
Yeah, that, that is what I precisely meant when I said uh, um, uh, that your feeling of deprivation is a, a, a little bit different from a, a typical Christian, because uh, Christians uh, sort of tend to see their community through their priest, while priests uh, see their community, uh, you know, more evenly because you interact with all members of your community. Well, uh, whereas parishioners, you know, interact uh, in the sense of, um, oh, this guy's interesting, that girl's annoying, this woman is fascinating, and so on and uh, and so forth. Everybody but, has their friends in the parish, but I yeah, know everybody. Precisely. Yeah, but you have to be the friend of them all, for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the priest. She's annoying, but I have to be her priest. He is a bit fat, but I still, I mean, yeah. No, everybody has their cross. Um, yeah. It can't be the same for everybody. But, you know, we, we get exactly the amount that we can take. Or the game. Well, sometimes we get a great deal more than we can take. and this, But that's by design. This is... This is on purpose because what is what is what does the scripture tell us that uh, God Christ's strength is made perfect in our weakness, but He isn't revealed until our weakness is revealed, until we run up to the limit of what we can actually manage, uh, and it's in that it's in our failure our smallness, that the greatness of God is revealed. There's a, a wonderful story by uh, 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 Corrie ten Boom, the, 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 the lovely little Dutch Protestant woman, okay. uh, used to tell. Uh, if any of your viewers are not familiar, Corrie ten Boom's family uh, were a, a pious Protestant family living in uh, the Netherlands during World War II, and they, they hid Jews, and they, they passed them along. And eventually they were all caught and arrested, and the parents were carted off to one prison and killed immediately, and, and the sisters went to another. And they, they uh, were kept alive, and they spent, I think, almost two years there. And uh, it was a, a remarkably awful experience, of course, of the prison camp, but one of the most humiliating parts was that all the prisoners were made to strip down naked before the guards. Uh, as part of their entry and, and at other times as well, a profoundly dehumanizing and humiliating experience. Uh, Corey's sister died not long before the liberation of the camps from disease. Corey lived. And after the war, she went, went around Germany and around Europe talking about God's faithfulness and how he had preserved her and uh, reflecting on her experience. And after one of her talks, she uh, was picking up her papers and putting her things away, and the hall emptied except for one man who came up to her and said, uh, Frau Cori, isn't it wonderful that God can forgive us of our sins? And he extended his hand. And she looked up, and she saw the face of one of the prison guards who had been standing there staring at her and her sister naked in, in, in the jail, in, in the camp. And, of course, immediate horror, revulsion overwhelmed her, you know, shock. She couldn't reach out to him. And in that moment, she cried out, oh, God, help me at least. And she, she said in her mind, at least to try. I can't do this, she said. I can't forgive. I can't. You know, this all happens in a flash. Mm -hmm. This crisis that happens in her thoughts immediately. I can't. She's just horrified by the, the presence of this person which you know, anyone can understand. But she makes just the tiniest little effort with her hand on some level. She wants to want to do the right thing, even though she can't. Uh -oh. She is not capable of forgiving him. She is not capable of loving this man. She is not capable of overcoming her horrifying revulsion of this human being in front of her. But she makes just the tiniest effort with her hand Toward him, And she says, in that moment, wave upon wave upon wave of the love of God poured down through her body for this man. 
and she loved him with the love of God, and she was able to take his hand and to love him and to forgive him with the love and the forgiveness that God had for him. But only in the moment of crisis when her own love was not enough, when her own faith was not enough, when her own strength was not enough, was God able to come in and fill her with the love and the power and the forgiveness that belonged to him that she needed. And I think that's where we have to come is to the moment where we're really confronting our own weakness, our own frailty, our own inability to get over this and realize the depth, the profundity of our need for Christ. True. Uh, Father, you reminded me, uh, I know this uh, priest, he serves in a small chapel here in Belgrade. He's elderly and he's simply a wonderful man. And, and when hell broke loose here in the Balkans during the 90s, he was taken to a Croatian uh, pris um, uh, pris uh, prisoner camp. He was tortured there. Uh, I don't know what they exactly did to, uh, to the prisoners, but he was tortured. And uh, after the camp was liberated for years, for years and years and years, he would get a phone call uh, on a relatively regular basis and um, he would pick up the phone and the receiver and the, the, there would be silence on the other side but he could sort of hear breathing and after maybe even a decade of this he finally heard the voice on the, and it was one of the guards and his uh, and the guard simply said father please forgive me i simply did what was ordered uh, i was i did uh, what they ordered me to and he said god forgives your child and you know and i i would say that in a similar way like uh cory is, is that her name and uh, you know uh people often say that uh, wars uh, m uh manifest the worst and best in man and this is uh, these stories uh, sort of showcase both where People are willing to go through orders dis despite how despicable they may be, but yet still sort of defeat themselves when evil self wants to overwhelm them. And, and, and for them to say, forgive me, and for the other person to say, I forgive you. So it's a wonderful, you know, um, victory Father of George, God in both. That's absolutely right. Uh, Father George Calcio, another Romanian confessor, Mm -hmm. who was tortured in prison, <clears throat> said, when you suffer a little, you become bitter. When you suffer a lot, you forgive everything. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, th th that's an issue. Uh, it, it is a difficult thing to forgive uh, our enemies. Sometimes when I get really annoyed with somebody, and again, these are all of these things are minuscule, uh, through which uh, when compared to what these people went through, I, I always say, uh, like, God, give them the exact opposite of what I want uh, for them right now. <laughs> give them long <laughs> life, give them joy, give them happiness, give them all the material goods and health. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been on the other <laughs> end. I've been on the other end of that, at least. <laughs> no, you were Too on tired. the, uh, no, no, no. You were on the screamed at end. You weren't at you weren't at this. I wish you all of the evils of the world. Then and yes. people, just so you know, <laughs> oh, one can scream did, did we, over did, Viber. Did we give him an epitemia for that? Uh, Milos, we can give him one. Yes. No, 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 not Milos. You. Well, I had to leave now. <laughs> you know that's a meme with Eddie Murphy doing like this. You know, uh -huh. <laughs> can't give me epitemia if I can hear it. <laughs> Here's the thought. Blog. <laughs> Here's the thought, and you 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 tell me if I'm wrong. Yes, you are. God wants us to ask for His blessing, for His help. God doesn't want us to go through th anything alone. That's yeah. absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Most of, we we spend a lot of time in our life constructing for ourselves the illusion of autonomy, mm -hmm. the illusion of independence, uh, of power, of control. Uh, and we're really reluctant to give that up for many of us, especially men. Uh, well, you didn't have to say it out loud. 
<laughs> now they're uh, now they're on to us. We don't want to. We want to. We 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 really resist because on some level, men don't like to face up to weakness. Uh, and and I think there's there's a useful function to this. You know, men need to be strong because uh, it is by our strength that we labor for our for the the benefit of our wives, our children. Uh, mm-hmm. Those who depend upon us, you know, we there's there is a need for manly strength and manly courage, and that doesn't, but that doesn't have to be uh, something that we are, are not able to balance with a recognition of weakness, of need. But that's what we often do. We often say, okay, if I'm going to be strong, I can't be weak in any way about anything ever at all, and so everything I must be, I must be strong and independent and stand on my own two feet in every way, in all circumstances, and never acknowledge any weakness. But that's not true. We need to be strong and courageous and manly, and also recognize that there are profound limits to what that can do and how much of that we can keep up. And it's it's a refusal to acknowledge that that leads to you know, uh, divorce, suicide, uh, Depression, which are you know really high among men, it's, moving it's, away it's from God, to acknowledge that we have weaknesses, that we have needs that we cannot meet ourselves, and that aren't simply reducible to needing more entertainment. I don't, you know, it isn't a third or fourth beer I need, or another hour of video games, or a lover. Uh, those aren't the solution to my existential problems. But that's often what we turn to because we don't want to face up to the fact that we do have weaknesses and limitations. And that what we need is for Christ to fill those and to take those to him and offer him that. And to say, Lord, fill here what I cannot. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, us people, we are supposed to become saints, but not through doing this or that or saying this or that or not doing this or that. That. It's 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 we we are su- supposed to become saints through God, um, so we can't do a thing without Him. Actually, that's the I think that's the conclusion. We can't do a thing, a thing without Him. Um, and I, I we think, can do lots of things without Him, like um, hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, you can go to hell, all on your own. You can uh, you know on your own terms. Well, the context is we're supposed to be on that narrow middle golden road. <laughs> You're absolutely right, though, that what we can't do is to become holy. We can't command the grace of God. We can't control the Holy Spirit. We can't even start the process. Everything begins and ends with God. And in the middle... We can cooperate a little bit. We can, we can, God shares with us in his creative work and that he lets us work on it. Uh, but we don't start it and we don't finish it. The scripture says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. God begins, God finishes. You and I have the privilege of sharing in the work in the middle a little bit. We can cooperate with it. He allows us to be involved in the creative process of working out our own salvation. We get, to, we get to participate in it. We get to employ our exercise, our will, but we don't start it and we certainly don't finish it. And if we yeah. try to, then God will allow us to break for our own, because he loves us. And if yeah, we're allowed when, to go when we're, that we way, see then the we, we'll be, right. And so oh. I, in a lot of ways, I see that as where we are in, in, orthodoxy in America is that God is allowing us to experience this tribulation, this suffering, so that our pride, our carelessness, our superficiality is broken, and we come to a place where we recognize the preciousness of what we have and the fleetingness of our life. But is it going to happen, though? Do you think it's going to happen? For some, it has to. for some, they'll, they, there is, there, some are simply waiting to get back to my life and yeah. have everything back the way I, I, I want it to be. 
and to just go back to normal. And await a bigger and meaner lesson. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know uh, how God's providence unfolds in their lives. I do know that I never know how long I have to live. And so who's to say I'm going to get another lesson, another opportunity to repent, another opportunity to learn, another opportunity to change my mind and my heart? This could be the last one. And so uh, from my perspective, there isn't any opportunity but this one, any moment but this one. And either I learn or I, or I don't. Either I accept this trial and this cross and I, and I try to bear it faithfully or I simply try to get things back to the way that feels comfortable and normal and good for me and waste it. Uh, but this is a treasure and I either have to, I'm either going to bury it in the field like the faithless servant, or I'm going to trade with it and make something out of it that is profitable for the kingdom of God. My choice. Uh, Father, this reminded me of um, one of the, well, it's, it isn't, I think it's not really a sermon, though I'm pretty sure that he has re reiterated that thought in many of his sermons from uh, Vladika Dmitri Royster. Well, I mean, we can safely call him a saint by now. Um, he said uh, that uh, in the gospel, uh, Christ asks uh, his apostles, um, who do people say that I am? And they respond, well, they say that you're a prophet. They say that uh your um, one of the ancient prophets raised alive and uh, christ uh, asks uh, peter and who do you say that i am and and peter responds you're the son you're the son of god and uh, vladika said that uh, this is a question that christ asks each and every one of us every day every hour every minute of our life and uh, our life is judged on what answer we give who do you say that we are, uh, that I am? A charlatan, a sorcerer, uh, a liar, a lunatic, Lord, Son of God, uh, one of the Holy Trinity, uh, a friend, a savior, Messiah, and so on. So many multifaceted answers, uh, some problematic, some extremely problematic, some outright dam damning. But uh, th th this is what you're essentially saying. What is the lesson? And every minute is a lesson in a way. So. Right, and it's one we're having to learn all at once in a very startling way. And so I have to hope that we do, because I would hate to think that we went through, that we suffered all of this, that we suffered this alienation, uh, the sundering of our communion together, of our, of our, of our being in community, yeah. The, yeah. the warmth and the kinship. And, and I have to say, a lot of this is informed by the quality of, the, of, of my own parish life. Uh, my parish is made up of a group of people. And so like every other group of people, it has its, its weaknesses, its imperfections, its flaws, its blind spots. But it is, it is really and meaningfully a place where people love each other and care about each other and where we do a pretty good job of putting up with each other. Oh, uh, thank God. And, and so uh, this experience of not being able to be together is 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 one that is hard on all of us and i would the the only thing that could make that worse is to think that we are going through it and that we've wasted it that we suffered all of this for nothing yes for some it will definitely be for nothing for some yet others just imagine that first divine liturgy when it's all over oh man the first one with everybody's there and everybody's joyful everybody's full of life you know it could be the the most ordinary liturgy in like i don't know may so even after the after feast of pascha and man for me it will be like yeah people are going to be seeing angels and all that yeah 
And for me, it will it will probably not be before the middle of June. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, so it I, definitely I, won't be. It definitely won't be Pascha. It won't even be the Apodosis of Pascha. The lead that's taking. That's what you just said. Yes. Uh, it will. It will be later, uh, and it will probably be one of the most precious memories I have of my entire life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Something somebody to look said, forward to. Yeah. Uh, some uh, someone has said. Um, I think it was a cat. Uh, some Catholic on Twitter. She said something along the lines: "Just imagine, in like fifty or hundred years, there will be saints who shown through this tragedy we're going through right now. Oh, uh, he found faith during this crisis. Uh, she rediscovered Christ." He, devo uh, he decided to devote his life to the sick or to the poor during all of this. And it really struck a chord. You know, it's interesting. I, I, uh, I have had, I have uh, some, a couple of people that I've been talking to that I've never met who are, you know, reached out to me. They're, they're interested in coming to the church uh, who have not been, you know, where the, yeah. They're just learning about it now, and uh, so this is—it's—it's it's a really—it's a—it it really is an opportunity uh, for for the proclamation of the gospel, for the cross of Christ to be made manifest. And I think I think it is in us when we witness to our love for one another, and I think it's betrayed when we allow ourselves to. Uh, get caught up in uh internal strife when we you know criticism and backbiting you know my bishop is doing this and yours is doing that and your bishop is a faithless atheist and oh you know yours is an you know a hyper zealot and you're you're gonna they get are, killed they are they're, they're all that yeah oh there's you know this uh this tendency we have to fight with each other and to quarrel with each other is very natural in one sense because we're all siblings, right? And siblings tend to be uh, really obnoxious and pugilistic toward one another. Uh, but it's very unbecoming uh, when we do that. But if we, if we, w when we get over that and stop uh, the pissing match, if you will, uh, and show our love for one another and for our neighbor in the way that we handle this with patience, and whether you agree with what the bishops have done or not, even if you strongly disagree and you think that this is that they should not have done this, to bear it with patience and with love and forgiveness and prayer is a real witness to the power of the gospel. And when we do that together and then serve however it's possible each other. And, you know, in my community, so for instance, in my community, uh, I'm checking in with people by phone and by text message a lot, and I hear from them. I called so and so this week. I checked in with, uh, particularly with my older parishioners or with my shut-ins. You know, I, people are calling. They're checking on each other, and that is a witness to the love of of God. But also, when they do things like bring, I, I have I have over here next to me a, a table piled up with food that people have brought. For those who are in need, we have uh, huge numbers of people in our community here who are out of work now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And very soon they will have trouble uh, affording food for their families. And so people in my community, people outside of my community have been sending food to stock up our pantries so that we can uh, help to provide food for those in need. So when the church does this, when the church bears patiently, and lovingly with the cross that she has to bear and serves the community of the church and those outside with however we can, then it's a real witness to the gospel. There is This is a real opportunity for us. If we don't get hung up on, I'm not getting what I want and things aren't going the way mm -hmm. I wish they were going. So, Regarding bishops, it might be coming from a place of a bit of hip hypocrisy, but it, I think it's it's also a matter of faith to accept that who's, whoever is leading the country, your country, my country, the church, 
being your OCA or the Serbian Orthodox Church. Um, I mean, I, I already kind of know that we totally deserve, <laughs> you know, who's ever guiding us. We totally deserve it uh, for for many ways, for, for many different reasons. Um, and not accepting it, it's, um, I wouldn't dare call it a sin um, because I, would. I, I wouldn't, you would, yeah. I, I, I just can't allow myself to be that subjective, but still it's something that is not becoming of, 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 of Christians. And I constantly, I have this discussion with people, especially people who are atheists. I'm, I'm surrounded by atheists in many, many uh, different communities I, I belong to. And some of them from time to time will ping me on this or that question regarding how the church is handling this crisis, et cetera, et cetera. And we get into different discussions about it. Um, and I constantly find myself either defending some faithful or totally doing the opposite. Like, <laughs> because, you know, my personal opinion on this entire thing, judging based on all the information I've, I've, I've read, uh, the videos I've watched, and there's there's a lot that there's, there's too much it's it's overwhelming for one person but i don't think that this virus is as dangerous as 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 it's being presented but still that doesn't mean i'm not supposed to listen to i'm not supposed to obey the rules uh because rules are for everybody um and and it goes directly into what you're saying people are entitled and they feel like this is how things have to work. And if you take it away from them, they, they just, they complain, they fight it. And it, it, like here in Serbia, you wouldn't believe, you wouldn't believe how strongly people fight it. We're talking about, we're talking about, um, you know, curfew and quarantine. Those are, the, those are the two keywords. Curfew from, I don't know, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. And then now the newest thing is quarantine, basically. 24 hour curfew from like Friday 5 p.m. to Monday 5 a.m. So, it, you know, and when it's not curfew, people just behave normally or they will do yeah. anything they can to behave normally. They will go hang out in the parks, uh, sit on the benches, walk left and right, buy so many things, clearing the shelves. It's like, they're doing the complete opposite of what they should be doing. Um, you know, the, the new law that's currently in the state says no more than two people at, at once in the same place. And I'm walking to the store today. There's like eight people drinking beer on a, on a bench. And I'm like, why? And I, I, don't, I don't see any difference between them doing that and Christians screaming, Let's go to church. Let's go to divine liturgy on, on, on Easter. I don't see a difference. I don't see a difference. You know, I, I often say that rebellion is in the DNA of Americans, but maybe it's not just an American thing. No, no, no. Uh, rebellion is in the heart of, a, uh, is in American heart. Spite is, is in the Serbian. Heart. <laughs> That's a very different thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, when, when we oppose our own country, it's pretty much the same thing as rebellion. But <laughs> trust me, <laughs> spite. You know, uh, I often hear even in Serbia that uh, no other language has word for spite, which is not true, <laughs> clearly, because we are talking about it. But we, uh, we, it is a trait uh, we are so well known for. Yeah. That um, th that we honestly believe that no other language has a concept of it. <laughs> the famous, uh, by the way, oh really? Oh uh, yeah. By so, the way, so tell um, me, can you re can you relate to this story? Let me tell me what, yes. if this is relatable to you at all. Yes, uh, it is. A, a farmer uh, wakes up one day and he goes out to milk his cow, and he discovers that his cow has died, and he's he, it's his only cow, and he's grief stricken and he falls down on his knees in prayer lord have mercy and an angel of god appears to him and he says god has heard your prayer 
and he is going to uh, he's going to raise your cow from the dead. And the farmer says, no. And the angel says, okay, well, then he will give you a new cow. And the, and the farmer says, no. And he says, well, then what do you want? And he says, make my neighbor's cow die too. Oh, oh dear Lord, that, that, that's not only relatable, we made that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. We, we actually have an expression. We literally have an expression. May the neighbor's cow drop dead. Literally. That's yeah, that is. Man. Yeah, that, that is literally our expression. The komšić crkne krava. May 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 neighbor's cow croak. Drop drop dead. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So this is this is like the extended I didn't version. Know, I didn't know. I didn't know it was a Serbian story. Well, uh, I don't know where the story comes from, but the expression we use on a daily basis yeah. is uh, is it's a very, a very Serbian, very Balkan thing. You keep saying Serbian. Yeah. It's a very Balkan thing. Yeah, yeah, Balkan. Um, yeah, I won't say it's specifically Serbian, but by the way, uh, one of the best things I have read regarding different bishops reacting differently. It was. Remember, guys, whatever your bishop has decided, even if it's contradictory among each other, they have chosen it out of love. You may disagree with it, but if your bishop has decided to close all the churches, he does that out of concern for you and for love of you. If he has decided for all the churches to remain open and to have full-fledged services, again, he has done that out of love for you. And... I think this is a really good starting point whenever we disagree with somebody, you know, generally with treating other people, you know, uh, some, somewhere I've read something along the lines of uh, uh, no woman goes to an abortion uh, like uh, a kid goes uh, to a candy store, uh, a woman opts for an abortion as a fox who, whose legs get trapped, uh, uh, gets trapped and she needs to chew up her own leg. Of course, there are exceptions to this. Some people are, real, are really easy about it, but you know, um, so I think that we often sadly disregard the initial, even if misplaced, good intention on other people's parts. So uh, I, think I know. The, I, I think the uh, the one the one thing that I've I've, I've seen repeated several times, which I I disagree with, yeah. and I find mistaken is is the idea that uh the bishops uh who who have closed things are are acting out of cowardice or fear mm -hmm. they're afraid of getting sick they're afraid of problems uh, which you know when when i had a a family in my own parish who uh were suspected to have the virus and and the husband was very sick and uh you know we're at that point where things could get better or they could take a sudden and dramatic turn for the worse. Mm -hmm. And I needed to go and hear his confession and give them communion just in case things did go really badly. Yeah. He didn't hesitate to send me. He didn't hesitate to send me right into the maw of potential death. He's not afraid of this virus, not afraid of death, not afraid of, you know, mortality. That's not it at all. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, actually, one of our uh, bishops actually passed away. Um, I saw that. I saw that. May his memory be eternal. May his memory, memory be eternal. He actually passed away, you know, with 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 the virus. You know, one can't say that the virus is the ultimate decisive factor. You know, but he did catch the virus, um, and he, in what happens to be his last. Uh, sermon that's what he said you know we're not afraid he wasn't afraid certainly uh, yeah. which is which is comforting to say the least um in the in the face of um you know the the information the news that you'll get from uh, countries such as spain and italy um you know i i i say this 100% from my own perspective, because I have felt this fear, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. I've, I've felt this fear. Um, I felt depressed because of this. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, even facing all of that, plus the possibility that I won't have a business to run in a, in a couple of days, maybe. Um, 
what 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 keeps me absolutely optimistic at the end of the day is um there's so much to gain from all of this all of them lose something i mean everybody's gonna lose like if we start talking economy the world the world is going to be losing for the next god only knows how many years um but as somebody very close to me says um calamity if that's a good word uh, gives birth to opportunity as well it's a great uh, word i love that word yeah and um uh, you know i think we should pray to god to give us wisdom to not to dwell on the fact that there's we are losing a lot uh, but to have the wisdom to see where the opportunities are um and deal with them you know in in, in with with proper priorities i i mean I, at the beginning i'm 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 here's like a confession at the beginning of all of, all of this i was actually pretty scared it, it was it combined with uh with my kid being sick and uh you know some of the things that, that started happening and i was like i freaked out i freaked out um but it it, it lasted it had its beginning it had its end and immediately after ending um it's it's i i can't say it's it's a struggle i can i can't really say it's a struggle and every time i would even consider calling it like that in my head i i remember christians being tossed to lions um you know we, we are not i don't think we are we are really suffering that much you know let's let's be honest you know we are not suffering a lot of us are a lot of us are not uh, in certain places, the suffering is is you know really severe. For sure. I have a priest friend. I have a priest friend who you know, who's in New York, and I I, I uh, messaged with him uh, last week, I think, and asked him how things were going. And this was before things had really gotten as bad as they are now. And uh, you know there had been a death in the community already, and the funeral, you know the only just yeah. the bare minimum could be done which is you know incredibly painful for a priest and for the family to not uh someone had you know had had financial because of financial difficulties related with this they committed suicide uh you know th there's you know people people are are there there is a lot of real suffering uh but this is th again this is something that's simply foreign to us but not foreign to human experience you know going back to my grandmother who lived through the depression and through world war ii and uh you know we came from uh, i come from appalachia that's where my family's from uh my my dad's side of the family grew up as they say poor as job's turkey uh in the mountains of east tennessee uh they didn't have they didn't have anything my grandfather remembers living in a house where the planks of the walls were so far apart the snow would blow in through the winter mm. uh, suffering and hardship were just a, a a part of everyday experience and so you have to develop a way of looking at things practice the habit of focusing on where the life is where the goodness is and not obsessing over the things that you don't have or the things that are hard because that will kill you. Just that, that will kill your soul. Easy. <laughs> oh man, that's so true. So true. <laughs> I have another great story on that front. Growing up in East Tennessee, you want to hear it? Does oh. it have a cow? It has pigs. I'm good for it. So, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I I grew up. I'm a convert. So I grew up. I grew up Protestant. Uh, country kind of evangelical in, in East Tennessee. Uh, and when I was a boy, there were at my church some real old timers, people who had lived in that part of East Tennessee back before the Roosevelt administration brought electricity into the Tennessee Valley. Uh, and there was one old guy in the community who literally remembered as a boy back before TVA brought in 
the Works Progress Administration brought in electricity, remembered being chased through the woods on his horse by a panther in the trees. I had a great story. This is a this is a man of, of, of incredible faith. He had a great story. You said his it family, was a pig. I'm getting to the pig. Okay. You got it. We're getting there. I'm just. This is the background. This is background. Um, this is the background to the pig. We're getting to the background. Well, it's actually several pigs. Uh, 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 so, this is getting pigier by the moment. Yeah, it, it's about to get gory. Uh, oh boy, so, there's the gore. This, this family, they were. <laughs> they were they were poor. They were poor farmers there in 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 East Tennessee. They didn't have much, but. They raised a few pigs, and every you know when the pigs got fat in the fall, they would sell, they would kill them, and they would sell off most of it to to buy the supplies they needed for the winter, and then they would you know they'd keep some of the meat for themselves. Well, this one, this particular year, uh, the the man's name was Jay. He was just a boy at the time, a young man maybe, a teenager, which back then was a young man. Uh, nowadays, it's just a, an adolescent, uh, but back then it was a young man. Uh, Jay was there at home on the farm, and his father was gone somewhere. Uh, a pack of wild dogs got into the pig pen and tore up all the pigs. They literally ripped them all open. Jay's mom hollered, and he came running in from the field or wherever he was. And he he went into the pig pen, and all the pig, the pigs were laying there with their guts out on the ground. This is his family's future. This is their life. This is their food. Uh, who? How can you survive the winter? They have no money and no meat with all these pigs gone. A very simple, you know, American Protestant folk, but with an amazing faith. Jay scooped up the insides of his pigs, threw them back in, went and got a bucket of tar, flopped the skin back over, tarred it back on, and then said, Lord, please help my pigs. Not one of those pigs died. You know... Uh... If it were me, we'd start frozen. <laughs> I was waiting for the moment, and then the panther came. So it's, it's <laughs> and it's it a, had a bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a really wonderful story. Come on! Wow! Wow! Please accept accept our apologies for making fun of it because it's it's this is an actually an entertainment channel. Maybe people don't get it yet, but this is an entertainment channel. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I was. I've been insufficiently entertaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's why you won't get the second invitation. <laughs> I, I think you you fit in perfectly. <laughs> uh, by the way, well, it looks the, funny anyway. By the way, uh, as uh, as inspiring that story is, the humorous implications of that um, uh, of that story are popping into my mind. Like I imagine yeah. some southern bell. Here we like, start. Uh, yeah, yeah, having pork and like, Jamesy, yes, Ima, does this taste like tart to you? <laughs> you know, what was funny is when Jay, when Jay told those stories, and he had lots of stories like that about his yeah. life, when he told those stories, he didn't tell them with a lot of pathos. He told them they were funny, uh, and he didn't think of them you know, in terms of, you know, dramatic terms, you know, miracle. Like, but this was, that was just his life. Yeah. You got by because God took care of you because God met your need because God miracles were, you know, you didn't have anything else to depend on when you didn't have doctors and money and resources and 401ks and backup. And all you had was your strength and God's mercy. That was all you had. Yeah. Uh, this reminded me of a story. Uh, did, uh, I think this was some documentary uh, on the lives of Coptic monks, and uh, this mentality something I uh, something I saw there. So you have this elderly ab abbot, and he's speaking. 
Well, yes, we have relics of St. Anthony and St. Theodosius and St. Macarius, for example. I don't know which, I think, I'm pretty sure it was St. Anthony, but I, you know, don't quote me on that. And, uh, uh, you know, we have the relics there uh, in the crypt. And this day, uh, and one of these days, these Protestants came. And they start telling us, you should believe only in the Bible. There are no such thing as saints. Everybody's a saint. They're not praying for you. And they said, fine, I'll, dis uh, I'll discuss it with them. So I went to the crypt and I talked to Anthony, to Tedocious, to Macarius, and they said, no, no, that's wrong. And the, the news reporter is like, and you saw them? And yeah, but the Protestants? No, the saints. Well, yeah. <laughs> To the abbot, it was more unusual that these guys, what these guys were saying, that he that that that, that, that he was communing with the saints in the crypt. <laughs> right. I heard a similar story uh, from Father Stephen Freeman about a, a trip to the monastery of Saint Catherine at Sinai. Uh, maybe this Where was apparently, it. Apparently, yeah, it, it, it's 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 not at all uncommon for uh, Saint Macarius to just kind of pop in and talk to the abbot here and there. That's kind of yeah. By yeah, the way, I just noticed that. Uh, so your names are on on your little screens that I see here. Yeah. Mine very helpfully has my name and then also in parentheses you. So I know that Father John is me and not uh, someone else. Thank that, that, God. Thank you for thank you for including that because it's very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean seriously, imagine if you were born. Well, that uh, would be confusing. I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but I don't have to imagine that. But I'm only speaking for myself, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, B. For your contribution, don't respond ever again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this was um, this was a very good conversation with a lot of great stories. Oh, yeah. Um, we might actually want to talk to you again, maybe, perhaps. Probably. You know, uh, our beloved diocesan treasurer who just reposed was also named Milos. And oh he was a great God, guy. Such so. a great name. Such a great name. He is Serbian, too. Yeah, he's, he's a great guy. He, uh, he's uh, one of the, the architects of our diocese. Uh, without, without him, it wouldn't be what it is. Milos Konjevic? So, uh, Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I remember yeah. his last name. He's he, he he was a great guy. He'd talk your ear off if you called him on the phone, but man, he was a wonderful he was a wonderful Christian and a, and a real blessing to our diocese. It's a great name, Milos. I tend to agree. Every day. Your wife probably says that to you all the time. Well, when he when she's speaking to him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he he keeps. Uh, um, placing my wife into into our conversations uh and she keeps laughing about it uh, every time she watches our episodes um <laughs> but one of these days boyan one of these days boyan with a y bang zoom to the moon <laughs> yeah oh yeah oh man i can only imagine what a great saint his wife will be <laughs> <laughs> so uh, can i uh, somebody has said that uh, the wife of St. John of Kronstadt was pro uh, was probably far greater saint than he was. <laughs> Imagine to oh. ha having to put up with that, and I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> probably true. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's like that poem of, that's a, uh, that poem about St. Bridget that's, uh, <gasps> Kildare, who that spends all that time saying she gave away her, her, her mother's shoes, she gave away her father's you know, cow and her uncles, every, you know, she gave away all the, so who's the saint? Bridget who gave it all away or the family who put up with her? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Father Dimitri sent me that poem and I have, oh man, I, I have goosebumps when I, when I remember that poem. It's such a great poem. Mm. Yeah, I also <laughs> have to apologize for wearing a hat, um, but we already checked that we are not, um, you know going against any sort of etiquette when speaking to a priest but if um if, if you don't we like call it him father that's enough yeah okay yeah we we, <laughs> we did address you as father i you know i hope we didn't insult you in any other way especially with the boy and looking at the way he he is and okay. making an inappropriate I, I uh i just thought i just thought you were kind of gangster 
<laughs> That's you know, I'm gonna have to write that down. Uh, if he removes his uh, if he removes his hat, he literally looks like a pineapple. So I think that looking like a gangster is that more intimidating than a pineapple. Though pineapple has a lot of sharp points. So you know, Chance the rapper also really likes to wear a flat brimmed ball cap. I can't rap for the life of me. I I would not suggest it. <laughs> Uh, Unless it's had, uh, church rap. At least you still have your hair. My hair's starting to go. That's what a lot of people well, tell me, but uh, then again, you did not see my hair right now. So uh, he has hair to export. Yeah, I can. Uh, you know, it's not women. Very who manly be. Serbian, eh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm a classic Balkan guy. You know, you know, coming with everything. You know, the temper and all that. Um, classic Balkan pineapple. Yeah, literally, you cannot go more Balkan than me. I used to, uh, I used to uh, paint houses. I used to work for a Serbian house painter who okay. had threatened to beat me every time I screwed up. That's it's very classic. How old was he? He was a good bit older than me. Yeah. Well, but you he, know, he threatened to beat me and the other guy if we screwed up. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that sounds. He wasn't uh, sounds... joking either. <laughs> that, that that sound sounds like typical master apprentice relationship. Yeah, work right or get the cane or candy cane. <laughs> just just a little bit of you know. So you, he would say he would say you screw you screw. <laughs> <laughs> now to beat me. Why do you make fun of his accent? Uh, actually, oh. I'm fascinated. <laughs> when when. There's, I have, a, I have a wonderful story to tell you about him, but I'll, I'll tell you off the record. Oh, yes, no. please. <laughs> so, one day, one, day, so he really liked me, even though uh, he would threaten to beat me. One day, he called me. He, he would just call me from time to time, just because he wanted somebody to talk to. So he called me one day on the phone, and he was just irate. He called me, and he's, he's kind of hollering into the phone. He had stopped on his way home. He decided he wanted a pizza. So he, he called a pizza place and he stopped on his way home to get the pizza. And he discovered after he, he got, he paid for the pizza and he left the restaurant and he opened it and he discovered that the pizza did not have any oregano on it. Yeah. One of, one of made few him, mortal Which sins. made him so mad, which made him so mad that he stormed back into the restaurant slammed the pizza down and said, this the pizza I ever eat. I don't want my money back. I just want you to know it. And he walked out. <laughs> and he called me just to tell me the story. Brantley, they did not put no oregano on the pizza. Can you believe that man? <laughs> he would do that to me all the time. Yeah, you don't do pizza without oregano. But no, no, no. Uh, um... It's like pizza without ketchup. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, 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 without uh, tomato sauce, puree. Well, uh, I use tomato sauce. You don't sauce put ketchup on ketchup. a pizza. What's the matter with you? Uh, yeah, that, that, I, I tried to save him, but uh, he was beyond saving. Um, uh, generally, in Serbia, people use ketchup. They don't use uh, what? tomato sauce. Yeah, that's true. That's we're getting better, but very slowly. We're cheap, we're cheap. Uh, we're we are still in ketchup slavery, uh, you know? So, I would not eat a pizza with ketchup on it. That's gross. Well, you wouldn't eat pizza here then. Actually, there are fancy pizzerias that use tomato sauce, thank God. Um, by the way... Uh, we can talk about pizza for hours. So Yeah, we should have a separate pizza team that episode. Absolutely, which, that's, that's which what I was going to go for. Which was, ironically, one of the first... Um, when we were uh, designing this podcast... Uh, podcast um, we made a list of subjects we were going to discuss, and one of the very first we listed was something along the lines of pizza. Maybe we should do I'm, that. I'm, I'm, I have a lot of opinions about this. <laughs> we might include, you might graduate to to that episode, but slowly. Gradually, uh, if I may say so. <laughs> do you eat from the crust or from the middle? Oh, don't answer that. Oh, no. it's a trick question. What, what do you mean? Uh, when you take a slice of pizza. Do you start from the tip or from the crust? The tip? What, <gasps> How what kind dare. of a question is that? How dare the you? The crust you're... is the handle. You're fired. You hold it by the crust <laughs> and you eat it from the middle 
<laughs> out toward the crust. You, you're what, fired what as my spiritual you father. You're fired. You're I, banished. I have Wait. a story. I have a story. You don't have a story. Nobody, nobody has a story. Wait, do you eat the Are crust you at all? Me that you eat the crust first? Do you eat crust at all? Of course I eat the crust. I don't waste food. Uh, okay, so why would you eat the worst thing last? You eat it's it the first. Candle. Boy, it's no, the the candle. well, first of all, the crust is not bad unless you have trash pizza, which apparently you do in Serbia. <gasps> uh, yeah. Part of your problem is that you have inferior out loud. pizza to start with. If you had good pizza, the crust would be delicious. Mm, Second, it burns. you can also use the, you can dip the crust in sauce. Oh, see, garlic and butter, garlic that's so butter American. or pizza That's sauce. so American, so American. Sauce no, 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 sorry, like sorry, sugar, sugar, sorry. Sugar. Brantley here, Brantley here began with, we need to carry our crosses. <laughs> To minister like an hour later on regarding pizza. That's a candle. <laughs> that, that's what I'm, we that's make what I'm pizza, you know, because I have a lot of kids, I typically make pizza at home. We oh. don't go out much because it's expensive. But uh, I've discovered that the key to making really good pizza at home is to is to not not to cook it in the oven or on a stone or anything, but to put it on my grill, my my charcoal grill. Because I can get that grill 900 degrees. Which is approximately the temperature of hell, according to research. Which is the perfect temperature for pizza crust. But not for sinners, right? <laughs> you always have to ruin everything. Uh, well, I don't, I don't, I haven't cooked a sinner before, so I don't, I don't know exactly whether that's the right, like, I typically smoke meat at low temperature and cook you, pizza you smoke it? at high you smoke it. Uh, here we generally use tobacco. Well, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you also, you also, I think there, I think there you eat a lot of swine flesh that you have smoked, do you not? Yeah, we do, we do. By the way, we have to have a separate pizza episode where we share uh, the best of the best of our pizza secrets. Uh, but we can't, we can't, I can't talk about this anymore during Lent. It's too painful. Uh, no, no. Uh, okay, let's discuss it next Friday. Is that okay time for you? That is not okay for me. Why not? <laughs> what on, what on earth possibly do you have to do I'm next eating Friday? Eating almonds and I'm I'm eating almonds. This is how this is the what I've been reduced to. Well, talk to the peanut guy here. <laughs> yeah, I ate a lot of peanut today, so I'm. I'm not going there, but I will tell you my story because everybody shared the story except me. So I'll share the sh the, sh the shortest one I can I can I can um, conjure right Please now. Please do. <laughs> um, you know, when we were kids, <clears throat> we used to constantly buy. Uh, you know, uh, you know where we went to school, and then there's the period when everybody goes left and right to go buy and eat something or do whatever they they want to do, and people they, you always had people. You know, kids with money and kids without money, and the kids with money would buy pizzas and whatnot, and everybody else would be, can I have a bite? Can I have a bite? Can I have a bite? Um, and it has become well known that you can have a bite of pizza, but it always has to be the crust. Um, and I remember we were no longer kids uh, going somewhere, going out, doing something, I, I don't know. Um, and a friend of mine, that was, there was like three of us um, walking uh, down the street, and a friend of ours bought a very big slice of pizza. You know, I'm not sure how big slices are in, in the United States, but you can, in Serbia, you can actually buy a very big slice. I'm talking a very big slice. But he was also very, very hungry. And as he was, you know, uh, trying to eat my the other friend was like can i get a bite and he very casually turned the crust towards him and then you know let him have some and, and 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 my friend was like obviously disappointed and being like why are you giving me the crust and i remember this completely innocent childish look in in, in my friend's face holding the pizza and he was like well you know crust is for friends right <laughs> <laughs> friends <laughs> i just that that moment just totally blew me off into my childhood um and i also remember this one guy 
who always had money to buy a sandwich. And we used to eat like uh, heated sandwiches, you know, warm yeah, yeah. sandwiches. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember there's con that he had, he always had stalkers, like people who intentionally followed him to see if he's going to buy a sandwich so that they can get a bite. And he, one day he decided he, he, he wasn't having any of it, you know, it has to stop. So he would, he would, you know, carefully look left and right. And when he would notice that he had followers um, waiting to get, to get a free bite, if immediately upon receiving the, the sandwich from the person, you know, who, who was making it and, you know, exchanging it for money, he would lick the thing left and right and left and right in front of everybody. And then he would like, he'd be like, does anybody want to bite? And um, that's how he got rid of the, the, the stalkers who would um, really, really, you know, leave him with half of the sandwich at the best. That's my story. Yay. Well, you tried your best. It's okay. No it, cows it, it, actually maybe in the sandwich, but well, yeah, for a, on the pizza. well, for a story that we didn't pay anything to Patreon for, it's good uh, as it uh, as it went. So. <laughs> Uh, we have to have a pizza cast. We simply now uh, we simply cast. have to have a separate episode. Yeah, there's uh, because we're what so. Kind of cheese, what kind of cheese do you put on pizza there? No, no, no. That's for the next episode. <laughs> Sorry, I have to put a vet on, on all pizza talk because I'm on uh, ketosis. I'm not eating regular pizza. I haven't ate regular pizza for almost a year, maybe even an okay, entire year. Okay, Milos will describe how he makes pizza dough out of ham. <laughs> <laughs> no, how to? Well, okay, fair enough. Challenge accepted. No, no, don't spoil. Don't spoil. What, what I, our I'm, I'm eager to hear about this. Oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we simply have to have that episode. Okay, fine. Friday is bad. How about next Sunday? <laughs> I'm busy. Busy-ish. Kinda. I'm gonna be eating my disappointment basket in the afternoon. <laughs> Lunch, uh, one Easter egg. <laughs> Look, we can include you in in a live stream we're gonna make that we call um, prayer breakfast, which we do every Easter. Oh yeah, why not? We can include you. We're, everybody's uh, gonna uh, be using their own disappointment basket, uh, but we're gonna do it together. Well, that sounds as good as can be expected. <laughs> okay, uh, let's wrap this up with cheese and ham uh, so because if we slide more to, towards pizza <laughs> you know I mean, it started well we we talked about good stuff and but then we we went to pizza and you know pizza just wins pizza always wins it's it's the perfect food of course i mean not in serbia not in serbia where it's apparently now oh, oh pizza. how you we don't know pizza. Look, in, in the United States, every pizza looks the same. <laughs> okay. It uh, tastes the same. Just saying. Okay. Okay. I don't want to witness a cat fight between a priest and, I mean, I do. A gangster, but, uh, gangster. He said it. He said it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, Father, uh, Father John, thank you for joining us for this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Exalted and uh, pizzish episode. Uh, uh, pray for us at the Teotokos dormitory, uh, mm. and uh... <laughs> he's saying that because one of the bills that comes to our church is always made out to dormitory of the Teotokos, <laughs> and I can't, I can't get anybody to change it. Uh, actually, if I were you, I wouldn't want for it to be changed because it's so hilarious. <laughs> it's just one of those things. Thank yeah. you for having me on your on your world famous podcast. Which one? Uh, I, I, oh, yeah. uh, my greetings to your millions of fans. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, they meal in your back. Uh, and Father, pray for us and bless us. And the Lord God bless you. That's it. Not again. Okay. Amen. And thank you. <laughs> that is what we get when we order a priest from AliExpress. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> bye bye. God bless you. Bye. <laughs>